Lisa is trying to figure out how to use this thing. Lisa is, hello, Facebook world. I am finally here. Lisa is updating her status. Lisa is staring at the computer right now. Lisa is 15 friends. Lisa is procrastinating the going to sleep thing. Lisa is, good morning, 22 friends. Lisa is goat cheese and an English muffin. Lisa's wishing she had a slice of ripe heirloom tomato. Lisa's wondering why it takes all morning to get nothing done. Lisa is 43 friends. You know who you are. Lisa's wondering if there's a 12 step program for Facebook addicts. Lisa is lipstick, heels, little black dress. Lisa is some enchanted evening, night, morning after. Lisa has updated her relationship status. Lisa is now in a relationship. Lisa's waiting for the person she needs to call to call. Lisa is phone ring already. Lisa is fewer calories than I thought. Lisa is up in the middle of the night and lonely. Anyone else out there? Lisa is... Anyone? Lisa is seriously? No call. Lisa is phone ring already. Lisa's going on a status updating hiatus. Lisa's back! Lisa is 62 friends. Lisa is www.laughlaughbaby.com. You will laugh. Lisa is bath and bed, I swear. Lisa is no longer waiting for the phone call. Lisa is on the phone call. Lisa has updated her relationship status. Lisa is now. It's complicated. Lisa is hearing how the words in a relationship can ignite a conflagration of fear in the hearts of men, or at least one man in particular. Lisa is extra ticket to the fill tonight. Any takers? Lisa's digging for a winter coat. Are we sure this is Los Angeles? Lisa is determined to make lemonade, perhaps icy lemonade, but sweet living well is the best revenge, icy lemonade slush. Lisa is discovering the way to unfriend. Lisa is 61 friends, but friends worth having. Lisa is up 60 bucks from selling the ticket. Lisa's realizing that the man she sold the ticket to is the man now sitting next to her. Lisa's thinking that if this were a novel, she knows what would happen next and there would be a happily ever after. At the end. Lisa's this is not a novel. Lisa is what is that? Odor? Lisa is in the war of the Philharmonic versus Halitosis. Hal is sadly pulling ahead. Lisa is not listening to his three voicemails. Lisa is torching the candy heart, literally. Lisa is wide open for new adventures. You hear that? Lisa is fresh pasta with grated cheese. Lisa is delicious fresh bread. Lisa is brownies. Lisa is now low carb. Lisa, is anyone else awake? Lisa is not uplifted by the formerly uplifting website www.laughlaughbaby.com. Lisa's wondering if she'll ever have a baby video to upload to YouTube. Lisa's missing her mother. Lisa is resentful of her friends who complain their parents come to visit for too long. 
Lisa is you never get it until it's too late to get it. Lisa is chocolate chips from the freezer. Lisa is not thinking about him. Lisa is 59 friends. Who went where? Lisa is sending $10 to each charity in the drawer of charitable solicitation envelopes that sent her return address labels. Lisa is stockpiling nickels and dimes from charities that sent coins instead of address labels. Lisa is down $160 and up 75 cents. Lisa is, if you're wondering if it's too late to call, call me. Lisa is, if you're wondering if it's too late to call, call me. Lisa is, if you're wondering if it's too late to call, just call me. Lisa is having a virtual breakdown in the virtual world. Lisa is scraping the peeling paint trim. Lisa is primer and the go-go's. We've got the beat in the tape deck. Lisa is not being verbally retro by saying tape deck. Lisa is deeply and internally retro by using the tape deck. Lisa's got the beat. Lisa, who is banging at my door? Lisa is yes, neighbors. I'm turning it down. Lisa is wishing he would stop breathing. Lisa is, did I really say that out loud? Virtual world equivalent of did I really post that? Lisa is flowered wallpaper and under that stripes and under that newspaper from 1909. Lisa is microscopically expanding the square footage of her apartment by peeling the wallpaper and paint. Lisa's wondering if there's actually a wall behind these layers. Lisa's thinking of the looks on the neighbor's faces when she peels through to their bedroom. Lisa thinks that she should wait for that moment when they start having their every other night sex accompanied by their loud, vaguely nauseating grunts, and then she should peel back the last layer and yell, surprise! Lisa wishes he would get out of her head. Lisa is 58 friends. Hmm. Lisa is opting to think of her neighbor's legs in his shorts as he returns from his Saturday basketball game just as she comes back from yoga. Lisa's thinking coincidence, synchronicity, or planned. Lisa is, get out of my head. Please get out of my head. We are not in a relationship. That's what you want. Lisa is wondering if her neighbor likes the smell of her sweat as much as she likes the smell of his. Lisa's wondering if when her neighbor showed up at her door to complain about the Go-Go's, if she should have invited him to dance. Lisa's wondering if their dance would have been awkward or if their dance would have been transcendent. Lisa's thinking transcendent. Lisa's thinking the universe would have celebrated the dance. People would have hesitated for a brief moment at their coming together, their cars hovering, their cell phones suspended, their conversations halted in the air as if someone from above had issued the purest tone from the heavens one that could only be heard in their hearts, and then they would have moved forward with a renewed sense of hope. Lisa is, but I did not invite him to dance. Lisa is, oh, there they go. Lisa is, oh, there they go. Lisa's wondering if they're looking into each other's eyes. Lisa's wondering if she'll ever have someone else's eyes to look into. Lisa's thankful for the friends who replied, yes, she will. Lisa is slipping between the stripes and the flowers. Lisa is gliding between the flowers and the newsprint. Lisa's lost in the news from 1909. Lisa is their breathing and their heartbeats and their skin against skin against skin against skin. And Lisa is, and they are done. Lisa is, I know this because all I can hear from the other side of the wallpaper is the dulcet tones of Letterman. Lisa is returning to the surface. Lisa's wondering if there's some sort of 30-minute sperm delivery service. Lisa is ready for a big life change. Lisa's really wanting the really big life change, in case you were not aware. 
Lisa does realize, yes, that big life change will not show up on her doorstep, but a fast sperm delivery service might be a genius money-making idea. Lisa is craving, cravings already, a bagel from a place, from that place that opens its doors at 3 a.m. to ex-New Yorkers who claim these are the only ones that taste like home. Lisa is ovulation. Lisa is. Lisa is saying yes. Lisa is. Did you hear that? Whatever it is. Yes, bagel. Yes, sperm. Yes. Lisa is. Why the fuck not? Lisa is forsaking the virtual use for her real world, her future world. Lisa is, don't wait up. It wasn't where he intended to go. Nostalgia Tour, flung at Cody in his car seat. Tantrum stained face, losing its brightness to hopefully he'll fall asleep glaze. It's so frickin' hot, the city streets shimmer. And it feels as if in a few more seconds the tar will morph into lava, sucking him and Cody into the deep. Turning the, them into a post-millennial pompeii sculpture that 25th century tourists could marvel at in a museum. Father and son in suburban utility vehicle, circa 2011. Oh, well, he had to move the car anyway. Another ticket would mean Lisa would have a real case for getting rid of the car. When parking tickets outweigh what a garage would cost, his explorer will slip out of his grasp. And with it, his last vestige of life as he used to know it. Life in a place where the sun always shone through the palm trees when he pulled up to the house for a little sliver of family time before sleep. And before another round of being the guy in charge. Blackberry in hand, Bluetooth in ear, conquering rush hour with deals and story notes. Life. That life. Months and 3,000 miles away from hoofing it down the street with a screaming toddler. Couldn't blame Cody for being pissed. Interrupted mid-DVD. Elmo, he sobs, bereft. Dragging sleepy-eyed tantrum kid past the doorman whose high five didn't pacify him at all. Doorman? They had a doorman. He thought, not unnostalgically, of the rat trap on Avenue C he last lived in here. Reliving the five-flight climb over heroin addicts. Right before, the riots changed Alphabet City into a neighborhood he left thinking he could come back to, but he should have known then. You can never go back. But he was 20 and stupid and couldn't have afforded to buy. In some alternate universe exists the guy that was him. The guy who never left the city. The guy who made it work here somehow. Buying in a shit-slash-hip neighborhood before gentrification while making critically acclaimed indie flicks with his rental income. Somewhere on the Lower East Side is that guy. The man he could have been. And someday, in the middle of a Twilight Zone alternate universe overlap, he, the man that he is now having moved back, and the man he could have been having stayed, will collide on the F jostling for space in the subway car, grabbing the same pole. And still, there will be no recognition for each other at all. He had been certain that he would return a rich and triumphant, known, fetid perhaps, film director. Not this way. Lisa with a job offer, too good to not come off the mommy track, career-wise, not money-wise. And she can't fail to remind him, even though he knows she doesn't mean to remind him. It's not as if what he's got going on, meaning nothing, could have uh, kept them where they were. And directorship of a non-profit, prestigious or not, is not good enough for them to suck up a full-time child caregiver until he has something in hand. Something not so delicately translated as a prime number with a handful of zero ducklings toddling after it. They pretend nap time is his work time. He's so fatigued by then. Nerves jangled by the manicness of kid TV or the keeping Cody out of the packed boxes. They wouldn't be so treacherous if they were unpacked and 
organized into drawers and cabinets and latched with those incomprehensible closures adults need to masterfully push two buttons of while skillfully popping a third with the other hand, making it too exhausting to put anything away. And he can see in Lisa's eyes how she measures his lack of unpacking progress instantly when she comes in at night. But she glosses over it as she calls for takeout or pizza or Chinese again. She's good that way. Bolstering him when she's tired, too. Cheerfully calling it, Take out the roulette! And he knows if he made the kitchen workable, some of the crap what have we gotten ourselves into tension would subside enough to have sex. Or at least an enjoyable evening. He's lucky Cody can't rat him out yet. But the day will come when the little bugger will say, Daddy starts playtime by checking his email and ends up surfing porn or gawker while I watch Blue's Clues and Elmo and, and Ubi. And believe me, Mom, I'm not all that unhappy about this setup, but Dad telling you he was prepping a pitch is unmitigated bullshit unless those forays into Facebook or Ain't It Cool News qualify as research. And yet... His life is research, claims his entertainment accountant as he juggles the numbers. He wants to tell her how she can't know how wiped he is. But of course, she did it for two years and fed the kid out of her own orifices. Oh my God, Cody, stop whining. Where's the fucking car? Last week, he forgot 109th or 111th before realizing that the tow truck guy was at the car ahead of his. And he saw that guy's... What is this dude doing with his kid in the middle of the day? Doesn't he work? Stay at home, pussy whip dad look. Which is what saved him hours at the impound lot. And a bigger dent in the cash reserve at least he doesn't know about. It's really a cash puddle. A cash salt lick these days. He's gonna snap. You don't have anything to scream about, Cody. Just you wait for the heartbreak and disappointment that's bound to come your way. But he holds back for once and is rewarded by the car. Hey, there it is. Lifting Cody into the car seat just as the parking enforcement guy rounds the corner, feeling for once he combined good parenting with everyday competency. Ah. I can do this, he realizes. Ideas, mental plans springing into his head, setting up meetings during Cody's afternoon nap. And then making a game of hide and seek out of just emptied moving boxes. Or, uh, uh basketball. With the wadded up paper surrounding the wedding china, making him good dad, efficient dad, uber dad. Dad who might even find the missing widget to the crib. He knows he tossed blithely into some box, sure he would remember, which only to not. Dad who would find the missing widget and set up the crib, as soon as he found a parking space, and, and, and thus enabling them to boot Cody from their bed after these six unsettling weeks. I No. Not going to think about the countless, doubtless, sleepless nights ahead retraining Cody to the crib. Think instead of his wife's sweet, grateful mouth on his cock rather than his sleeping son's restless foot kick to his groin. Because that's the dad slash husband he is. Once he finds a parking space. Oh, trying to ram into a half space while missing a real space down the block while trying to excise car from half space. Cody, out, 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 out. Now he's cursing the guy who got the space. He's cursing his kid. He's cursing himself for keeping the car because if he gives it up now, he knows Lisa will hold it over him in a little way she won't even know she's doing. Shit. He reaches back in a blind, groping attempt to find the pacifier to plug Cody up. Wean Cody from pacifier, he adds to the to-do list that Super Dad would accomplish before his wife came home. And not with the bacon, but with the money to buy, said Bacon, if he would ever venture further than the corner bodega, scrounge for meal makings. Costco! That's what Uber Dad would do. He will drive to Costco. Stock the bare cupboards. Overload the shelves with toilet paper and paper towels. Spend money to save money. A full fridge and pantry will inspire the unpacking of boxes labeled kitchen. Unpacking and gendering unpacking as the apartment magically unfolds into the landscape of their dreams. A place for entertaining a satisfied wife so at peace with her surrounds she has nothing better to do than fuck him blind in her amazing way. Because he's obviously the Martha Stewart, domestic perfection, blended with business acumen dad. 
Costco, here he comes to fix his life. It's an adventure, bucko, he cries as he crosses the park to the FDR, feeling the uh, tightness ebb from his body as he gains speed. He grew up in the burbs of this city, after all, and driving, the freedom it represents, is what he needs for sanity. Ironically, recalling when he and Jeff would swipe their parents' keys and drive into the city late at night to feel the tension of suburbia leave his body. Just the same way as he told his 17-year-old self that his suburban days were numbered. And yet here he is, driving to Costco, the mecca of overwhelming quantity. Man with purpose. Dad on a mission. Cody's tantrum not losing power so much as his own powers over it, becoming those of superhuman dad. Superhuman dad can ignore his own son's whine without it grating on its nerves. His powers to tune out are so strong that Cody has no choice but to subside. Forgetting the singing, dancing, red, squeaking moppet frozen on pause and the DVD player at home. Talk! He cries. Truck. Able to quell tantrums with a single hand dad. Truck! He Shouts back to Cody, reveling at the moment of father-son bonding. Talk! And then he sees the sign. The so familiar exit of his youth. And in a split second, across two lanes of traffic, the proverbial wrong term perhaps, down the off-ramp. It's a nostalgia tour, Cody. Check out the old neighborhood. See how things have changed. He hasn't been back since he moved out west and back east. Parents having downsized the suburban homestead to a gated community steps away from assisted living. He and his brother barely, uh, well, not speaking, friends moved on. My high school, he shouts. Hey, right there is where daddy got stoned before chem lab. But when you grow up, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to tell you I didn't do squat. That's what your mother wants. And when you're 25... And I'm ancient. We'll, uh, we'll light up together. I swear. And there's the deli where I made 10,000 pounds of potato salad in the kitchen one summer. The elementary school. The rifle range in the basement. Guns brought into the school as an after-school activity. And right around the corner here is where Daddy and Uncle Jeff... Now, uh, I know you don't know Uncle Jeff, but he looks exactly like me, so you'll recognize him, and that'll weird you out one day. It'll get fixed, but uh, you'll be forever grateful that I am not pressure you to go into the family business, Dad. And I am follow your dreams, Dad. And you may not be the prince of nail polish, but you'll be your own man. Look at that. Looks exactly the same. Right there is where Daddy uh, grew up with uh, Grandma and Grandpa. Gamma? Pipes Cody, looking around with a uh, Pavlovian expectation for pink frosted animal crackers. Bam. He's momentarily blindsided by a moment of incomprehensible sadness that Cody was gonna grow up, and if he's lucky, we'll call him twice a week or text message him, kind of sadness. He should end the nostalgia tour right now, but uh, as long as he's gonna wallow on the extra dimensionality of time passing, he goes whole hog. Takes a left on Romaine, or right on uh, Alden, and another right on Pepperidge. And pulls up in front of Sharon's house. Realizing that the ominous I can't believe I came back here silence is not a movie soundtrack punctuation, but is really Cody, tear-stained, red-faced, asleep in the back seat. And whoever had it now would have done it upright. I mean, new windows, new paint. An expansion on the second floor in what was Sharon's old room. He's uh, momentarily shaken that the sight of his losing his heart and soul to another, uh, not to mention his virginity, was uh, not kept sacrosanct. 
Where was the plaque? Josh lost it here. Uh, he's out of the car without realizing when a woman comes out the front door juggling an infant car seat and diaper bag and pocketbook and keys and 10 steps down the front path before she sees him. He knew it was her 10 steps ago. And in his head, he thinks, what would Super Dad do? He'd jump in the car and peel out. And instead, he looks in her eyes, looking in his, as at the same time, they both utter the ubiquitous sentence of middle age, I was just going to Costco. Her body is the same, but different. Familiar terrain marked by the natural disaster of leaking press and the man-made disaster of jellied belly and C-section scar. She doesn't hide from him the way she did when her body was tight, thinking at the time that she was artful in her covering up and he wouldn't notice the self-consciousness. <laughs> they laugh about it now as she comes back from checking on Cody and her daughter napping. Naked. Once 15 people have surrounded your open legs trying to pry out a baby and a different six have participated in cutting you open and every relative and friend and, and many complete strangers have seen your naked boob as you try to get the baby to latch, damn it. Who the fuck cares who sees what? She too is amazed to find herself here. Not in bed with him. She seems to find that as inevitable as he but uh, living in this house when she always thought she would go. But she returned home to care for her dad, diagnosed with cancer. When she met her husband, you know. Well, it's his turn now to lay out his trajectory from since they broke up to since they just fucked moments ago. And he starts with meeting Lisa and how she felt like his salvation at that very moment and how meeting her was when everything took off in his career Then he can't get his mouth to tell her how it's all gone so entirely off track. There are the words he's used till now describing this period as one of uh, regrouping, pre-production on nothing but the spin, spin, spin is everything. A precious short period, he gets to spend with his son full time, but the spin can't come out of his mouth. It's just a dry rasp of uh, disappointment, not having measured up, feeling bereft of longing for the thing that he doesn't know how to get anymore. Whereas the last time he was here in, in this house, in, in her body, the not knowing how to get there was fine because he, overconfident youth pre-dad, he knew, he just knew he would. Now he knows. He, Probably won't. Well, she's kind enough to confess she bought his movies on DVD to watch during insomniac nights, trying to find herself in them through his eyes. But she couldn't. She came home uh, late one night to find her husband watching the second one laughing at the restaurant scene, looking up at her as to say, why do we have this? Uh, DVDs not being their thing. They like the big screen. And how he recommended it at the next dinner party they went to, saying he couldn't wait to see what this guy came out with next. She can see in his eyes he doesn't know what the next is. <laughs> He's about to say he can just tell, well, maybe this afternoon will be the inspiration for the next. Don't say it. When Cody's whale from the unfamiliar crib and Ella's whale, inspired by Cody's whale, forces them into a, a panic sitcom madness of finding scattered clothes and redressing. Daddy's right here. Cody locks his eyes on his father's. Elmo? <sighs> he chooses to find the warehouse aisles soothing and ritualistic as they stroll each aisle, filling his voids with shrink-wrapped half-dozen boxes of shells with cheese and oversized bottles of sunscreen and conditioner. He shivers his way through the refrigerated section and stocks up on slabs of meat while Sharon stocks up on bagels and locks. 
And they agree uh, he will buy a tray of strawberries and she blueberries, and they will go have these in the parking lot. He resists the intoxicating bin of tube socks. She blithely tosses a carton of always with wings into her cart, and he remembers Lisa scribbling Tampax on the bodega list post-it. And he stands before them, confused as usual by the myriad of choices, until Sharon throws him the carton of assorted. He feels the double take of his high school self, painfully twisting his wrist to slide his hand down her acid-washed jeans. Jordae, uh, Sasson, Vanderbilt. So a finger could reach Nirvana. With his middle-aged self checking out her ass in the loose maternity jeans with the front panel that she's still wearing under the oversized shirt. High school self had seen this future and run from it. But high school self would never have understood the backstory. Cody cries at the heat of the car seat because bad dad forgot to cover it. But a cup holder full of strawberries and one of blueberries distracts him from the alleys. And Sharon's comment about the way he quickly staved off a tantrum makes him save the day, dad. She settles into her front seat to nurse Ella before heading home. It doesn't let him linger. Go, she says. Now the going's good. Though there's something about her good. Like there's something about him going. That will and won't be that. Well, the going's not bad. Elmo's manic giggle relentlessly repeating from the back seat and Cody's delight in his new sucker dad purchase. It doesn't quite permeate as he realizes that this airlock between his present past and his present future is swimming with confusion of who he just was and what he just did. Did he really just do what he did? Did not seem like him, but he was there in search of something maybe one day he'll find. He's going home with this part of him now. And going home will not have to be not just a resolution of looking forward, but of action. Making making things new again with Lisa, with, with Cody, with their new home. With the understanding that everyday disappointment has clouded his ability to access what he loves about his loves. But it has to be rediscoverable, right? And then just for one second, it clicks into his being. Someone, granted the husband of his high school love, but someone who doesn't know him, who isn't related or hoping for their 10%, someone is waiting for what he's going to do next. And he pulls the SUV expertly into the open parking spot right in front of his front door. Lifts Cody and red giggling fluffy companion out of the vehicle with one hand and unloads groceries with the other. Because that is the man he now is. She promises him she will be first in line at pickup. This is a dangerous promise, but she can't make his hands unclench from her shirt, and his snot is spreading a Rorschach blot on her side. Mama guilt oozes from her pores. She has been assured that five minutes after she leaves school, Cody is bright and happy, cutting out rectangles and sounding out words that begin with the letter K. But right now, he is convinced she is consigning him to the ninth circle of hell that is first grade and convincing her of that as well. With the adrenaline usually reserved for mothers picking Volvos off of their toddlers, she shoves a supersized package of Skittles into his sticky hand and pushes him into the classroom, listening to his little fists Pounding feebly on the door. First in line at pickup, I promise. How nice that Cody is so... attached. Willow Morgan stands there. Surrounded by women whose names Lisa can never keep straight but has dubbed the carbon copies. All Willow aspirational but a little blurry around the edges. How can any of them even approximate Willow's preternaturally youthful glow or shining waterfall of hair and plump lips she attributes to her self-denial of any substance non-plant-based? 
What smile do I give her? Lisa wonders, choosing a, what a lovely compliment smile, over an, I'll pretend that insult was actually something nice smile, but kind of really only achieving an uneasy, uncomfortable, half-assed smile. Instead, as Willow's perfect Madeline blithely opens the classroom door to reveal the tear-stained Cody shoving handfuls of bribery skittles into his mouth, while the teaching assistant lunges for the bag as the other children pounce on the few that roll away. There is a collective gasp from Willow and the carbon copies. She is sugar-shamed. Willow holds out a biodegradable reusable platter. You look like you could use one of these. I made them for the birthday celebration in the park this afternoon. Gluten-free, nut-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, and so delicious. I was up all night. The other half of the batch is cooling at home. They are cupcakes elevated to the highest art form, each adorned with a three-dimensional, very hungry caterpillar, molded, Willow claims, out of gleaming, carcinogen-free, organic soy fondant. Sidebar! Let us be clear, dear reader, that this school has no, no sugar, no nut, no dairy, no gluten policy. If this classroom had a need for dietary Nazism, she would have been all for it. Let us be clear, dear reader, that this refusal to sully their children's bodies with anything not grown organically or locally, boundaries of East River, the Hudson, Wall Street, and Cloisters for sourcing, is purely self-inflicted in the parent one-manship that has become parenting. The word free being a prison in and of itself. Let us be clear that Josh would never make the first in-line promise, or any promise, and therefore never flood Cody with disappointment. Let us also be clear that Lisa has been fully informed by Willow and the Carbon Triplicate that if she were only to source Cody's snacks from the window box in their kitchen, her own skin would be tighter, her hair not so gray, her child not so childlike. Lisa grabs a cupcake to prove how disgusting unprocessed treats are and takes a defiant bite. It's utterly delicious! I know. So good, right? I'm going to go home and finish up the next batch so I can come back and wait to be first in line at pickup for Madeline to share her day with me. First in line at pickup? Could it be that Willow's soulful, thick-lashed, willow-green eyes flashed demon-like for a brief moment? Could it be that Willow and the Carbons know that Lisa is never first online at pickup, trying to squeeze a few more minutes out of her workday that has to ramp back up to speed between Cody's bedtime and midnight? Could it be that they have heard her make this promise before? She slinks to the street brushing futilely at the delectable crumbs that Cody's snot has glued to her chest. Not so great mom, trying to find the veneer of confident working mom. She must slick over herself in the next few blocks before the anxious phone calls from grant applicants who can't upload their artist statements. But the day is contaminated by the ever-present willow earworm of first in line at pickup, first in line at pickup, so that at 2.41, running into the subway where a current of exiting commuters carry her back onto the street, where 2.45, bolting up Broadway, running backwards, hand in the air, waving furiously at anything yellow, crazy woman sweat flavoring her armpits because the Uber app picks just that moment to need to update. 2.49, taxi flashes his lights at her as he pulls to the curb and she now runs forward, oh merciful glorious driver who will make her be on time mom. And then, swooping in front from out of nowhere, a dazzling natural glow momentarily blinding Lisa, the cab is stolen, the door is slammed, and it soars past her with Willow's face gleaming at the window. Where the fuck did Willow come from? She wouldn't call it a saunter, but more of a stroll. As she approaches the end of the block-long line of chatting and texting parents, as she hears the school bell ring, she strolls past the end of the line with the nannies and the caregivers and the stay-at-home dads, past the part-time moms and the full-time moms and the bored grandparents who refuse to understand why kids don't walk home from school themselves anymore, and past the carbon copies who stare in amazement as she approaches Willow at the front, brandishing out a distinctive purple, non-recyclable box 
from which the delectable aroma of the freshly baked emanates, mixing with the very same smell, wafting off of Willow's biodegradable reusable tray. I think you left this behind. The flicker in Willow's eyes betrays her, and Lisa knows that Willow knows that she just has to flip open the non-recyclable bakery box top to reveal a dozen not homemade and definitely not nut sugar wheat gluten free very hungry caterpillars dancing about on very processed very delicious cupcakes compliments of sinfully yours on 71st and broadway all the way uptown and willow will go down Lisa's hand moves to the top of the bakery box as the thunder of elementary school feet set free comes closer. And then she notices, just at the part of Willow's shimmering mane, the telltale line of gray sprouting in a natural way next to the evidently unnatural gleaming brown. And it dawns on her. Willow isn't your real name, is it? And under her breath, Willow surrenders. Wendy. And with that admission, Lisa is free. She turns to go to her rightful place at the end of the line because Cody will be fine, even if she's not so perfect mom. When Willow Wendy grabs her hand and pulls her close and the carbons are too flabbergasted to scream, no cuts! and she is enveloped in the joyous arms of her boy. First in line, mom. Lisa sleep breathes next to him. It's not a snore, but not quiet either. He's awake again, seduced by the rectangle of blue light, needing to know what's happening in the world. That's what he would say if anyone asked. Would anyone ask? At least he could turn over and say, what are you doing? He could gather her to him and say, I'm worrying about the world. Could she possibly want to hear that? She claims to not see the point in worrying when you could be doing. He thinks this is a backlash. She has to get up in the morning. It's true. He also has to get up in the morning. In solidarity. Or because he doesn't want to seem like a lazy asshole. He'd like to think she and Cody don't know a lot and go back to bed soon after they go. Not dreaming, but drifting. He doesn't think he dreams anymore anyway. Why do you need dreams? Everything's such a nightmare. He scrolls through the world and its problems. Wonders how any of it can ever be fixed, how anything can be mended. And if it can't be mended, what's the point? Of showering even. Making sure the dog has his shots. <laughs> Sending an email to that guy who his trainer thinks is a producer looking for a breakout indie film. He knows the point, but what's the point? <laughs> working, working with the trainer to begin with. Of showering after working with the trainer. Of following the fat-burning food regimen because to quote said trainer... Future you will thank me. Is future me even a thing? Because look at the world. This world. Why isn't anyone else trying to make sense of it? Why are they just sleeping through it? Of course, not everyone else, because there are filaments connecting him to Aunt Beverly C.K. and at Extrospective Guy, who also cannot sleep. At Beverly C.K. and 
that extrospective guy who gather him into their virtual arms and say, they too are worried about the world. If only, only worried insomniacs could save the world. Hmm. Thinks about his mom sewing the ripped seams in his shirt. I'm saying, good as new. But whenever he put it on, he felt its difference. And the knowing that it, it was never quite what it was. He thinks about his brother. And every time he's thought of calling and hasn't called. He thinks about the line bisecting his father's chest after the surgery. and The man he was after it was closed up. Which could only be described as a diminishment. A weak Xerox. Reflection. He thinks a greater rectangle of light interrupts him as the door opens and Cody sidles in. <laughs> Not anticipating his father being awake, mulling the insanity outside their apartment. Hoping to not be sent back to his room because even the dog has to sleep in here. And with the whisper, things are scary when you're alone with your dreams. Things are scary in the middle of the night. There are ravenous monsters that only come out when he sleeps, you know. And he knows. He holds up his hand and beckons. Cody slips into his arms and settles in. <sighs> Taking the phone from his hand. Silencing the light. Silencing at Beverly CK. And at extrospective guy. <laughs> Cutting the filament of worry. The phone is off. And the world goes away. Except for his boy in his arms and the dog on his feet. Lisa rolls back over into him, her breath on the back of his neck. They are a six legged, six armed, three headed monster. Gaining strength for when daylight comes. And maybe nothing is as good as it once was, but maybe this just is what can be right now. She has no idea what his name is, so she names him Gus. He is white-bellied and furred. He is large, skin stretched tight in a way that is strangely seductive. Lush as if he is filled up, just beyond completely, brimming. Maybe he'll be here. <sighs> she sheds her pantsuit. Hated, dreaded. Waistband, cutting into perimenopausal, post-holiday, post-having no time to herself. Flesh. Releasing the bra that tortures her breasts daily into a more compact, immovable form than badly approximates perky. They spring free. And down. She grabs her towel to cover up because she should cover up. She is between the perfection of youth and the don't give a fuck gravity winds of old age. She's in how did my body evolve to this? She would look better if she paid attention, if she did something about it, damn it, or 
didn't eat that bagel with cream cheese every morning, but went for something whole grain with jam. She wants something richer and denser to cram into her mouth and more real on her tongue than jam. And that is why she is putting on her speedo under her towel and thinking she should have shaved, but it's winter and therefore an implied maintenance-free zone and why she's hoping he will be here and thinking, what if his name is Gus after all? Gus, of course, after the polar bear in the Central Park Zoo that Cody had voted for most Saturdays when he was a toddler. Gus, who swam back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, while his girlfriends lolled on a nearby rock and hoped that the plexiglass between him and the staring, snot-nosed children would disintegrate on the next lap so he could surf out of the zoo and over to the subway and escape which never happened. It's not that he looks like Gus. It's that he looks like Gus. She spies him as she leaves the locker room. Gus. Man Gus rather than bear Gus. Gliding through lane three, flesh buoyed by the water, steady in his stroke, Flip turning at the wall and back again. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Is it that she admires his pace, his stamina, his seeming imperviousness to the boredom of the back and forth? The stroke, stroke, breathe. Stop at the end of the lane, hope the 30 minutes have passed to find out it's only been two and again. Stroke, stroke, breathe. Is it that he's a man who can obviously be alone with himself while she can't anymore? Dreading the silent time underwater with nothing to distract her spiraling thoughts. You would think after last year, three of them crammed into the apartment for months on end with sirens punctuating the exact moment she managed to give the horrors of the outside world a slip, Trying to amuse a kid who could no longer be amused, she and Josh weathering it all by being ridiculously polite rather than diving back into each other, that she would welcome wending her way through water. She's working on being out and about without anxiety, though the smell of today's chlorine echoes the bleach she still wipes down with daily, even though Josh has begged her to dial it back. She's trying to make herself agree with her therapist that she has to embrace the world she missed so much again, without a mask of any kind. But, oh, there he goes. Back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. What is it about that that makes her want to fuck his brains out? Note, she can't remember when the last time it was she wanted to fuck anyone's brains out. She assumes it was Josh. That'll be only right, right? But that look at someone across the room, lurching in her groin, Attention, please, cries body parts. When the hell did that last happen? It's all crazy tired these days as they slipped back into modes they had vowed to not return to. Distracted by the ever-pinging of the next email or text, the doctor's appointment sandwiched in between missed sessions at the gym and a vain attempt at technology-free zone family dinner, as the email alerts and text siren call from phones relegated to the front hallway. The illusion that someone out there needs me, cares for me, wants me. Wanting to feel wanted, but does she know how to want anymore? Does she know how to want Josh anymore? She wants to want Josh, she thinks. 
Does he want to want her? Because even the feeling of wanting to fuck someone's brains out, that requires full attention. And the actual act, that requires a willingness to be bone-tired but radiant with secrecy the next day and constantly thinking if she could just get the sleep, the bills paid, the clutter declutter, the laundry folded, she'd be all in the fucking brains out mode or even just the fucking mode. But her body just hasn't hunted in its storage room for that old friend desire, theoretically in hibernation, but willing to wake up, evidently, for what's behind the water curtain in lane three. Lane three. White belly seemingly undiminished. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This morning, Cody raided her gym bag and bathing cap and goggled himself, waved two tampons on his head like feelers, and ran around the apartment half naked. I'm an alien, I'm an alien, I'm an alien, I'm an alien. And it would have been funny, it could have been funny, if it wasn't 7.48 and if they didn't need to be at school at 8.05 and if Josh, maybe, had seen a glimpse of humor in it, she would have too. But yet one more admonishment from Miss H for Hitler, they muttered to themselves when reading emails about Cody's lack of attentiveness and need for restraint in the classroom, was not something they were up for because they were in the whose day ranks higher in importance battle, and she was losing with her inability to claim everything hinges on this meeting the way he could, though most likely the hinge would become unhinged after it, the way his projects always fall apart, and her job, steady, is what keeps them afloat. So shouldn't hers be more important? But she couldn't bring herself to make the case for it because it always leads them to the same dark fight without a possible end. She snapped at Cody for readjusting her goggle straps. Who am I? She wondered, while she pulled the cap off of his head just a little bit too hard. And realized, as the elevator pinged, that she and Josh hadn't kissed goodbye, hadn't even said goodbye, and that he probably hadn't noticed either. Cap, goggles, earplugs. She's an alien, she's an alien, she's an alien too. Cody at 12 should be able to walk on his own, but he still is that kid who doesn't want to let go of who he was. And truthfully, she would rather go 15 blocks out of her way than worry if he got to where he was going all right. Tracking him on a parental app that her own parents, who only cared if she got home for dinner on time, would mock endlessly. And seriously, after the sheltering in place, the endless hours spent together, you would think they would be eager to separate, but instead it has made them, both him and her, more tied to each other. The elevator doors throw themselves open on the fifth floor, and she stares across to the apartment where that couple with the three boys live. The one so polished and sweet, she suspects they are a government-created synthetic prototype of the ideal fem family. And her heart quickens a little with gladness when she hears the mom's voice rise in irritation. Only to realize that it wasn't irritation, it was singing. With the three boys. And then they crooned. Hold the elevator <laughs> in a laughing barbershop quartet. And she did press hold against her darker impulses, and they flooded into the elevator, also late for school, but somehow not aggravated. But la di da almost conspiratorial glee with each other, mother and kids against the world. And she just smiled what she hoped was a believable, your family gives me faith in the world smile through a tightening in her throat until the family hit the ground floor and the fucking Von Trapp brothers spilled into the lobby. <sighs> she flip-flops, flip-flops to the pool steps, earplugs diminishing the chatty Cathy's in the walking lane and the pulsing beat from the gym spin class. 
Goggles blur the world at the edges and she feels a foreign being in a foreign land. An alien, an alien, an alien. The other night she told Josh she thought she had dropped a shirt in the laundry room. And since he didn't offer to get it, their extreme politeness has faded. She threw on sweats and trudged down the stairs and in its past midnight martyred mood. She could hear the washing machines going, flouting the no-starting laundry after 11 p.m. building policy, and glanced through the window to see a pair of long legs, followed by the rest of Mrs. Von Trapp, lying on top of the vibrating machines in a quiet ecstasy. She could see two baskets of neatly folded whites next to the dryer and noticed suddenly that there were no clothes in the washer, just water sloshing through the rinse cycle. She watched the washer's vibrations accelerate through the spin cycle, Mrs. VT vibrating alongside and then stop abruptly. Mrs. VT dug in her pocket for more quarters, slotting them into the coin slot. One, two, three, comes up empty, another empty pocket, no more. Laundry interruptus. She had some loose change in her pocket. She wanted to toss it to her and say, go wild. But instead she stood behind the sterile door until the laundry baskets had been gathered and the elevator doors closed behind a visibly post-solo coital Mrs. VT. She gathered her coins and slipped them in. She wanted to, but couldn't go further than her hands lightly touching the machine. Later, she found the shirt in the dry cleaning pile. She has a choice, lane two or his lane, lane three. Where should she go? Where will she go? She slips into lane three. Man Gus is at the far end and she pushes off from the edge. Stroke, stroke, breathe, stroke, stroke, breathe. She feels the water disturbed around her as he passes her going the other way. Stroke, stroke, breathe. She hits the wall, turns, they pass each other again. Stroke, stroke, breathe, hit the wall, turn. This time, they turn their heads in sync as they pass by. They breathe in each other's air. They turn back into the water and she is pulled into the rhythm of her body stretching for the next pass. Hit the wall, turn yearning for the moment. He moves the water to caress her, hit the wall, turn. He changes his stroke so his wave tickles her thighs. They breathe in at the same time, hit the wall, turn. His hand brushes her ankle, electric touch jolting through her. Gus, hit the wall, turn. They glide by each other and she lets her hip touch his belly. Hit the wall, turn. They glide by each other and she lets her hip touch his belly. He has dived down low, passing under her. She can see him, she can reach him. She drops her hands, her fingertips softly skim his surface. He rotates in the water and for a second there, they face each other. Him looking up, she looking down. The polar bear and the alien. They sigh, bubbles float away. A water dance of almost. A wave crashing inside her. A life lifted away. A moment of, of complete nothingness in her mind and everythingness in her body. Stroke, stroke, breathe. Stroke, stroke, breathe, hit the wall, stay.
She stays at the end of the lane, gasping her breath back as he goes back and forth. Hits her wall, flip turns, waves to her with his feet. Back and forth, she moves her leg so his hand, hitting the wall, grabs her thigh. He comes to the surface. Sorry, he tells her. She's not sorry. Till next time. She pulls out the earplugs and takes off her goggles, the world familiar once more. She dries off, compresses, molds, and pantsuits. Alien turned once again back into who she is. She grabs an apple from the bowl at the front desk on her way out. Bites. She opens the door the way she has a million times before. The apartment seems quieter, less full. That can't be, right? Cody's gone, but he's not gone gone. He'll be home in six weeks for October break. She's not going to be that mother who counts down on the calendar. She is not. 47 days. She's not going to text incessantly. Stalk his Insta, send him cheery, are you up, video voicemails. This is the day they never thought would come, and now it's gone. The kid who would sobbingly suction himself to her leg at drop-off had given her and Josh quick hugs and said, Drive safe. Drive safe? She's not going to turn his room into a shrine. She's going to look in there right now and see how she can use it while he's away. Scrapbooking. Crafts. Meditation den. Masturbation den. That would be wrong, right? He circles the block, looking for a parking spot. That day, Cody in the back seat, and Costco, and all that came in between. Sharon was a person he might know on Facebook about four years ago. He didn't click friend. She obviously didn't click either. Neither of you click friend. Did you still find solace in each other's bodies for an out of body afternoon? He just wondered what it would be like if in a year her daughter wound up at the same college as Cody. Would they be drawn to each other for some reason they can't understand? They finish where their parents started? Would that be weird? Can you fit in there? No. Well, maybe that was a guess, but it's behind him now. Mini swooping in triumphantly. Maybe even after a five hour drive home with Lisa, he isn't quite ready to face the emptier apartment. Maybe even after working with Cody towards this moment for the last 18 years. He doesn't want to think of a home without his daily sounds making it complete. Cody's room smells like Cody. And it is both breaking her heart and distinctly unpleasant. Once his little boy's smell changed to adolescent smell, she'd had a hard time with it. The rancid sweat that seemed to dig into the towels and sheets without respite. Desperate to find the little boy, which 
she had to admit was kind of ridiculous because when he was a little boy, there were moments, more moments than not, when she couldn't wait for him to grow up. Officially, this could be the when he's not home guest room. She could revive those dormant friendships that have been waiting for when the kids grow up, when the work winds down. They could find themselves laughing over who they thought they would be and who they are and commiserate about the lack of, who knows, periods, sex, intimacy, skin elasticity. <laughs> that would bond them back together now. Step one of the not shrine, she's gonna change Cody's sheets. The guest room's sheets. Circle the block again and again. Bypassing his 10th time around, he sucks it up for the parking garage rule. Maybe this will be the charm. Maybe he should be asleep when he gets in. Maybe that's the charm. Or if she's awake. Would that be it? Are there words to the charm? Where would those come from? The flannel ones. Cody's favorites waiting for him because really, I mean, is she really gonna invite friends she hasn't stayed in good touch with to come stay anyway? And if she did, would they even show up? She wonders if Josh wound up at the garage or stopped somewhere along the way. At the bodega for ice cream? That would give them both gas, but she'd prefer it to them consenting to the vegan stuff because then it's just a pale recreation of the first time with the rail stuff. Attacking the pint, two spoons and microwaved hot fudge poured on top and stickiness leaving trails and the kisses they left on each other's bodies. How can she remember that when it was so long ago when she can't even remember what she was looking for five minutes ago? Pillowcases. She goes to bed earlier than he does because she needs to be functional in the morning. But why couldn't he slip in early? Express interest, take her Kindle out of her hand the way he used to with her books that she loved and turn her turn on about the sex scene on its screen into something tangible and then go back to his late night watching movies for inspiration jagged writing jaunts. She could power down her Kindle and grab his remote and tolerate his protests that he hates when the story gets interrupted and distract him fully with her mouth, hand, cunt. She could be the rekindler. But somehow, wanting to be wanted wins out. She goes to her secret stash of dark chocolate and melts one on her tongue. He strolls home from his parking space. He commands his phone to check Facebook. Now he could command it to post the dropout picture of the grudging Cody from just six hours ago, but Lisa did it almost instantly and he feels behind the timeline already with all the how can this be possible comments and likes and loves. How can that be his little boy in that almost man's body? Then he tells it to search her name. Just to, to make sure what happened, happened. <laughs> she looks the same. Not the same. Again. But, uh, unmistakably her. And Josh goes down the rabbit hole of her life, scrolling back and back and back in time to wonder realizes she posted something moments ago and could possibly be virtually. 
right next to him right now. She commands her phone to find Cody and watches the little picture Cody dot slowly moving through his campus, wandering his new home. She suddenly misses his rancid teen boy smell and regrets the Febreze and the clean sheets. She pulls his comforter around herself and regrets, regrets, regrets each moment she was distracted mom, annoyed mom, or working mom. Not in an anti-feminist way, but in a, you used to live in my body. What do I do next? Way. And to think. His smell wouldn't exist if he hadn't been created out of a sweet night of one pint of ice cream with two spoons and hot fudge poured in at one inch intervals. To think his smell wouldn't exist if the press of humidity hadn't inspired Josh to stop for the ice cream that sweet night. To think his smell wouldn't exist if she hadn't said yes to the second date she didn't want to say yes to. To think his smell wouldn't exist if she hadn't gone back to the bagel shop that night, the next night. To think their boy wouldn't be their boy. He hustles down the unair conditioned hallway and it always feels muggier and hotter than the outside. She is brought back to the now by his keys in the door. His first steps in, check the living room, their bedroom, before finally finding his slight smile at her in their new almost guest room, still somewhat Cody's room. I laugh when he holds up a <laughs> pint of real ice cream, a hot fudge, and two plastic spoons. Her laugh. Always her laugh. When was the last time she was alone like this? Well, there's the tech in the booth making the machine descend over her head, so... Alone-ish. When was the last time she was alone like this with her thoughts? She has cultivated a superior method of the moment there is no one to connect with to insta-connect, gliding between Facebook, MeWe, Origins, and Zounds, and it's in a rounding circle to ward off exactly what she's facing right now. Ready to go, Lisa. Wait, what? Oh, it's not God talking, it's the tech talking. Boomed into this strange lumescent tent that they promised her wouldn't be claustrophobic like the MRIs of old. But remember to stay completely still. The guy who asked her not to move, who decided to startle her enough to move. She has that feeling that him calling her Lisa is like him thinking he's talking to her like she's a friend, to put her at ease. And although she would never be the way she made fun of her mother for introducing herself as Mrs. Frey, which always seemed formidably formal, she wishes there was an interim step, that he wasn't so palsy walsy Though, after all, he's looking at her brain right now. She's letting this complete stranger into her brain. So, maybe he should call her whatever he wants to call her. Hold on tight, Lisa. He told her his name. What was his name? What's his fucking name? <sighs> Jesus, Lisa. You've always forgotten names. That's nothing to stress over. Is it? The machine roars to life, spinning around her. She is the center of the merry-go-round, colors whipping through. Don't forget to stay very still. Is that the equivalent of lie back and think of England while I ravage your brain? See, she still has it. She'll just call him God Boy. 
But wouldn't God Boy know that she's not very good at staying still? Tell me a fairy tale, God Boy. A fairy tale memory, like how she and Josh first met. For which, like for so many other things, th there is the story she tells people and the story she tells herself. The story she tells people because when her friends catch each other's eyes across the room, they exude daily satisfaction and happy endings. But the story of how she met Josh starts with meeting the guy online, actually on a rail line for the bagel place that starts making them fresh at 3 a.m. that was around the corner from her place in the up-and-coming neighborhood in the Netherlands between Mid-City and downtown LA that never really up or came when she lived there and how she woke up to the smell, though really she was channel surfing infomercials inspired to self-improvement, and felt compelled to pull on sweats and her coat and get one, though really she planned to buy a half dozen to scarf before morning. And she met this guy online, a musician, post-gig, munchies and just her type, I mean, really, just the type she wanted, but not the type she ever got. Post-performance sweaty and electric, and they edged their way to the counter, she wishing she had brushed her hair until he twined his fingers in it and brought it to his mouth. Really a signature move, she understood later. And she let him, mesmerized, thinking this moment might possibly be the moment her life was going to turn around because... Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? A first kiss, the earth slows down for, and the guy behind the counter asks, What can I get for you? Really, she almost screamed at the guy behind the counter for ruining this defining moment of her romantic future. And the musician ordered. Really, she wondered if he would include her, but he just gets one. So that romantic gesture is off the table. And then she's so worried he'll leave, she contemplates going carb-free, but... That would be weird. But he walks her home, and they picnic in front of her building and laugh that the guy behind the counter had obviously handed her the wrong order. Her bagel, yes, but nestled between enormous black and white cookies that are the bakery's other New Yorkie in L.A. claim to fame. A dozen, at least. And she hadn't even noticed the weight of it. Really, she was too worried about her breath, her zit on her chin, her stubble on her bikini line, her cellulite to notice. And she fed him a white half, and he fed her a black half, and she leaned in so he'd kiss her, which he does in a way that is thrilling, but really had too much resonance of onion bagel and scotch and pot to actually be thrilling. And he clamped his hand to her crotch right away, which was dangerously exciting. About a quarter of the way through, Lisa. Doesn't God Boy know she's reliving dangerous excitement right now? Doesn't Godboy see the dangerous excitement running through her brain? Will Godboy be excited by her excitement? Aroused? As much as when the musician clamped his hand to her crotch right away, which was dangerously exciting, but really unnerving and uncomfortable and not what she imagined. And she thrust her tongue in his mouth to encourage him, and he pulled away. Really, he pulled away. Though she put her hand to his head to keep him there, and he shoved her away and puked all over the grass, and she wondered if she should hold back his hair, and won't this be a story to tell the grandkids when they're old enough to know about first meetings that you hope are momentous, and then they actually become that. And when he finishes retching and looks over at her, and she gives him what she hopes is the most understanding smile in the world, Really, the look on his face is one of not recognizing her. As if he didn't know her and he got transported to this lawn with this girl whose sweats and underwear are rudely pulled around her thighs. And he stumbled away. Really. She thought he would turn back, but he rounded the corner. She pulled up her pants and went to her apartment and shoveled in the black halves of eight black and whites and called for one facial system and one miraculous weight loss system and realizing that if she had a system, life might work out, but hung up before launching her credit card. She went back again the next night, hairbrushed this time. But dangerously exciting musician wasn't there and the guy behind the counter said, back so soon I thought I maybe put you on a sugar overload. 
and she looked at him for the first time. Because yesterday she hadn't seen him. Really preoccupied with the type who never really wanted her. And today, he wasn't objectionable in any way. Really, wasn't objectionable. That's a great way to start. He was a film guy and liked this time of night because of who came in and reeled off some celebrity names and paused and said, and of course, you. And then it dawned on her that the black and white cookies were from him to her. So she tells him it wasn't until she got home that she found the cookies and she wanted to go back right then, but it was late. We really could have been like that. And tells him she ate her favorite black halves of the cookies. And really, she did. And he tells her he craves the white part. And she leaves out the musician's finger inside her as she invites him over when his shift ends and plans on black and white cookies on their anniversaries to come. And when he does show up, bagels and more cookies and coffee in hand. The discovery. Oh. The discovery of this man she wanted to know fully and completely. You're a champ, Lisa. Well, a disingenuous lying champ, but a champ. Does Godboy know the lie that no one else knows? Could Godboy see into her brain and see the lie? A white lie, really. So not a white lie, Lisa. What if Josh hadn't wanted the white half of the black and whites, when the black half was eaten in a rage-eating binge over the man she noticed first. Who would she be now? An honest soul. Where would she be now? Maybe not in an MRI machine? When Josh asked her one night if she wanted to see the musician's band, she thought she'd tell him now. After 20-some-odd years of being together, he might laugh at the idea that it was not him she came back to see that night, but what if he doesn't? That's a chance you could take, Lisa, because this is another opportunity for a new beginning. Because this is one of those turning point moments, a chance for a deeper understanding. Or not. It was Josh she fell for. Josh she weathered the storms with. Josh, whose fingers were ultimately so much better than the musicians. And right now, you're done. What? The carousel spin slows to a languorous stop and lifts off. Her spinning doesn't stop right away, though. The world goes quiet. She's done. Thanking Godboy Tech and saying it really wasn't that bad at all, and scanning Godboy closely for a sign that he just witnessed her memories, and hoping he could tell her everything in there is just fine. Is everything just fine? There's no discernible answer in Godboy's face, in Godboy's goodbye. In the waiting room, a man looks up from his magazine with a reassuring grin that seems like he's practiced it a lot. And for just a second, she sees him but doesn't know exactly who he is. He looks familiar, though, like the middle-aged version of the guy who gave her cookies. And then she knows. Josh. Are you certain you wouldn't like me to try it? He is. This is a drive he knows he should make on his own. Even if car lady doubts his ability. Auto drive off. Let's get started. Her voice is British and clipped. And although he says it helps him hear the directions over the endless drone of traffic and NPR, He's pretty sure Lisa suspects that when Carletti says, in 500 feet, turn right, 
he gets a throwback thrill to the AFS student from Shanghai who lived with him when he was in high school. Mika, who shivered from the moment she arrived in January until she left in March. Unless he was huddled beside her under the covers in the drafty guest room, praying his mother didn't venture upstairs to see how her new daughter was adjusting. Let's get started. What Lisa doesn't suspect is that when he tells Carlady he will be manning the wheel, he still waits a little too eagerly for the sound of Carlady's voice to tell him what to do next. In 500 feet, turn left on Fulton Street. It's not as if he doesn't know how to get there. It's that he hasn't been there. No. Oh, because why go back to a place you not wanted? Why go back to a place you didn't want? Turn left. Is this 62? Having to reconvince himself daily that his 26, 29, 32-year-old choices were the right choices. All paths would have led to exactly where he is now. Now happened for a reason. It's not too late at all to make a change, to pick up a choice denied many, many years ago. At least he didn't sell out early. He's selling out late. In 500 feet, turn right on Rockaway Avenue. He's selling out now. Turn right. In 900 feet, turn left onto Atlantic Avenue. He's re-securing his future with his past. Maybe he's ready for something new. Even if the something new is something old. Turn left onto Atlantic Avenue. Estimated wait time in traffic... Three minutes. Jeff's face across the table. His brother's face full of emotion. Josh threw out the takeout menu and said to him, Fine. You buy lunch and the business is all yours. I'm starving. It was another day of the highlight of the morning being the summoning of the menu book to pre-order lunch so it would arrive at precisely 11.45. It was another day of trying to gulp down a deli sandwich or Chico's chili without the nail polish chemical smell somehow imbuing each bite. It was another day of fighting with Jeff. Always wanted to keep things as they were when Josh always needs to make things more than they are. Nail polish, the spectrum of the Pantone color palette. Hmm? All right. Nail polish, colored after the flags of third world countries with portions of proceeds going to charities. Nail polish with glitter, or beads, or mood affected colors. If his life was going to be nail polish, nail polish, nail polish, and Josh wanted to sex it up. Josh had to sex it up. Jeff wanted it to stay the same. Keep right onto Conduit Avenue. Fine. You buy lunch and the business is all yours. I'm starving. Sold. For a slew of chicken wings and a bowl of mashed potatoes. And cobbler. Jeff's face. Full of excitement and hurt. All at once. He got what he wanted, didn't he? You are now the owner of a heart full of righteousness about sacrificing for your art. You, and a head full of brilliant ideas waiting to be made happen. You can now go be a filmmaker and change the world. Just face. Full of excitement and hurt all at once. And the understanding that he got what he wanted. But... At the same time, what he got was his brother's rejects. Yet another hand-me-down to the 22-minute younger version who might have been identical, but always felt like a bit of a, an old office-copied Xerox. Jeff's face. What will it look like today? In 1,000 feet, keep right onto Southern State Parkway East, Belt Parkway East. Today. 
when Josh confronts him with wanting his maybe unfair share, how will Jeff react? Will it be the same way Josh has reacted over the years? Disbelief at the splashy love it in the women's websites about the beyond red line that stayed old time FYN nail polish manufacturers have taken hands by storm with. Seething green pus in his chest at the Wall Street Journal article on Jeff's sexy revamp of the company. A pulsing in his temple when visiting relatives talk about how he's now completely estranged, total stranger twin, surprised them with his creativity that they would have expected in Josh's line of work. Is it work if you don't get any work? But not in varnishes, as the older generation called it. And Josh, wanting to scream, he stole my ideas! That he told me he would never implement with me. He ripped my share out of my hands by making me see a future without fun, full of boredom and daily repetition, fights, and the menu book. The menu book. And never being able to make a decision and carry it out because Jeff would always say he wasn't good enough to do it. Jeff took what was mine. He said that once to Uncle Abraham. Abraham put his hand on his shoulder in a way Joshua was sure was a prelude to sympathy. He leaned into his ear and said, Get over your fucking self. Keep right on the Southern State Parkway East, Belt Parkway East. He had Uncle Abraham to thank, because the echo of get over your fucking self propelled Josh to write the screenplay that went out that everyone loved but no one would make, which uh, got him the meetings and the hot scribe buzz and a couple of websites that no one goes to except procrastinating screenwriters. But it, it did get him hired. Note the quotes around hired, because payment in artistic satisfaction was not particularly satisfying for the web series that everyone also loved, but no one monetized. So he was loved, he was admired, he had artistry, and really, his therapist tries to tell him, that's what people long for? What he has? Artistry. It's funny. Because what he longs for now is a way to pay for Cody's grad school tuition and Lisa's ever-mounting bills. Lisa. Who claimed she empathized with him completely over his rift with Jeff, but was the one who sent Jeff's kids birthday cards and signed his name. Lisa. Who would never leave her sister behind, but even though most days she would admit she didn't like her at all. Lisa. He's your brother, she would say. Call it the fight she could never win. Lisa. Who doesn't know what he's about to do, he is doing all for her. Lisa. And we'll never really know. In 1,000 feet, take exit 22 south toward Jones Beach. Jones Beach. Where he and his brother would head to the minute their dad let them go at the end of the summer day in the factory. But learning from the bottom up while poaching their brains in chemical fumes. Body surfing till the stars came out. <laughs> The day they stayed so late, a couple of guys grabbed their wallets from their towels, and he and Jeff tackled them, but were outnumbered. And black eyed, bloody nose, limped their way back to their car, <laughs> somehow invigorated, if not a lot broker, and the look in their mom's eyes when they got home. Worried, but glad they finally joined forces. Merge onto Meadowbrook Parkway South. Places look different and the same. Crappy Burger King replaced by a Starbucks. Dry cleaner still there. The deli. My old pizza place with a new sign in the window. Plant-based cheese, vegan meat, 
carb-free crust. That's three more blocks he can claim what's rightfully his. Get over your fucking self. Rightfully his. Get over your fucking self. When he flew in for six hours for Jeff's wedding, because he was in pre-production, hadn't planned on coming at all, and, and saw the, uh, the frat brother ushers escorting the bridesmaids down the aisle, the roommate standing in the best man position, and how he pictured the movie version, where the groom would stop the ceremony to rearrange the Under the Hoopa clan to include the brother who had made the surprise, sacrificial cross-country flight to get there, and realizing in this family it would never be the movie ending, and wondering why he ever hoped to have his, his hopes elevated rather than dashed. Your hopes? Oh, God. He tried to make Jeff's wedding about him. 500 feet, take Merrick Road West and get over your fucking self. Abraham was right, of course, and in a way Josh knows now, he, he couldn't have understood then. He, he wanted out, he was grateful to be out. His love for drama, to begrudge his brother, his little other half, his success enough to undermine it with the familial rift. Because he wanted the business to fail so badly, he wanted to get out and never have the chance to look back and rethink, regret the way he is now. Ah, this is the stupidest idea on the planet. Why would Jeff even want to talk to him? Why, why would he even think about sharing? Wouldn't their twin genes mean Jeff would gloat in the not turning out the way he assumed career Josh had stubbornly stuck to, assuming all would work out? I mean, what big dramatic moment is he creating here? What movie scene possibility of reconciliation? He needs to stop living his life like he's not in it. He needs to, to live with what he said he wanted in the first place. He's going to put this drive behind him. He's going to... Stop avoiding the nail polish end caps in the drugstore. Wish FYN well every time he sees one. Turn right. He's going to head back to the city. He pulls a U-turn. Do not run away from this problem. Turn back. He's going to look for a real job. He, he's, he could consult. He could, uh, something. I don't teach. I, he's going to wish Jeff well and not think his twin owes him anything. And suddenly the wheel moves under his hands. The car swings around to its original path. And even though he's pulling desperately against the rotation, it's gone out of his control. And the car takes a right turn into the parking lot, pulls up next to a Tesla with the license plate FYN Boss, throws itself in a park, and turns off. You have arrived at your destination. You have arrived at your destination. He tries the ignition button again and again. It, it won't turn on. And car lady goes silent because she knows he knows he can't escape what he has to do. The 1990s computers have been upgraded, but other than a fresh coat of paint, it might as well have been thrown back in time. He sees his brother look up from a conversation at his assistant's desk and not recognize him before recognizing him. He also is pudgier. His shoulders also a little more hunched. But his baldness is the too clean bald of a different kind of chemical infusing his body. Jeff. Lisa had been right. He should have listened. She'd been right. And he lost all this irreplaceable time. It's 20 feet to his brother, but he has the distance by coming to meet him. Arms wide. <laughs> Jeff. Jeff. And in his brother's arms, he jokes out the words he should have said long ago. The two sweet men are here again.
their names are on the tip of her tongue. The, the younger one looking like a taller 2.0 version of the older. They brought ice cream <laughs> and the chocolatey warm thing that goes on top. They are sitting with her in the warm room with the wall where you can see the cold outside. White stuff on the branches, white stuff on the ground, white stuff falling from the sky. It's sweet. The cream. The younger man making sure she is served first. Someone taught him right. He talks to her like he knows her and shows her a photo of another man and a little boy. 3.0, she thinks. And he's talking, she knows, but the words float around her like they aren't allowed to enter her brain. It's like the white stuff falling from the sky, but not disappearing into the ground. Did he call her mom? Is she his mom? She will ask. He is showing her a picture of another man and a little boy. And the boy leaps out of the photograph to dart around the chairs and walkers and chairs that wheel and old people smile as he picks up two spoons from a tray and sticks them close to his head, yelling, I'm an alien, I'm an alien, I'm an alien. <laughs> he leaps onto the table and down and skids across the floor. I'm an alien. Oh, full of you. The younger man yells at him to stop. The older man yells at him to stop. But she thinks he should not stop. She thinks he should let her come along. And she leaps to follow him around the chair, past the couch. There are people shouting a name. Who is Lisa? Who are they calling? She is on the table, ready to fly to the... Just look through to the other side of the clear wall to the white drifts that beguile. <sighs> like a siren song of where she needs to go next. Lisa Frey had a laugh that probably spawned hundreds of thousands of fairies. And her wicked sense of humor made you feel like you were included in on the joke. She hated telling anyone her age, so we're certainly not going to post it here. But uh, we'll, we'll keep this video eulogy site going past the normal 30 days. and You can visit when you think of her. Tell us why she's in your mind in this very moment. She's in our minds at every moment. Even as she became distanced from her own. And we, we know that that's how she's going to live on, in our thoughts and dreams and hearts. It's, it's impossible to encompass all that she was in a few sentences because our life is both very short, very long. But we know that if you're visiting this page, you touch your life in some meaningful way. <laughs> if you're not here for that, why are you here? By we, I mean her son Cody and his husband Yale and their son Liam and uh, Josh. He's more grateful she married him than she probably ever knew.